Um, so I want to kind of spend a couple slides recapping. Uh, we had some new folks walk in. If you could just, we're going to pause and we're going to have everyone introduce themselves. You know who's in the room. Um, say your name, your title, and where you're from. Raymond Pindle, Miranda Solutions, Franklin, Tennessee. Rob Group, National Student Community. And did, I think we missed one. Arnie Reed, CEO, Raymond. Thank you. Um, so I was going to mention that what we're going to do is go through a couple slides just to bring some of the folks that have not been in our discussions up to speed on where our discussions have landed with the participation of our members that have been in discussions regularly, um, noting that that is a different group than the group that we have here in the room. But then we're going to talk just generally speaking about barriers to adoption. And am I loud enough without the mic? Because I know that for some it was a little too loud, and also I tend to have a teacher voice, so. Oh, okay, gotcha, okay, gotcha. Um, so, um, so, so then we're gonna go into discussion about barriers to adoption, because if our goal is to move the needle and get more organizations adopting verifiable credentials and globally interoperable verifiable credentials at that, you know, what is stopping us right now so that we can remove those barriers and so we can be successful going forward? So we want to have a really focused conversation about the education market, think about what our personal organizational goals are and what are the barriers stopping us, and we're going to like start brainstorming them on the spot. Um, so that's the focus of our conversation today. So what I put up here was just to bring you up to speed in terms of education cluster 2023 goals. Um, we had said we wanted to get five organizations ready to play credential agent operator for any issuing institution or organization, activate 500 primary source issuers, that's institutions of higher education, informal training education, states, et cetera. So we were nonspecific about how that broke down, but one of the reasons we pitched at 500 is <clears throat> one of the members not here in the room has already set as their corporate target at 400. So that gives you the idea, like one of our members already is trying to issue to 400 institutions, not in the US, but actually in um, abroad. Another organization had said, we're gonna bring our 20 organizations on board. Another organization is bringing their seven or so organizations on board. We saw a number of demonstrations yesterday of wallets and technologies. So that's what we're, we set as our goals. We upped it a little bit to 500 or more, we're absolutely gunning for even more than that. Um, we wanna get four districts or states issuing credentials to educators. That's one of the things that we, we put out there. That may be something that has some barriers and something we should talk through. And then we wanna achieve three million credentials offered, figuring that if we want a million claimed, we have to have a little more than that offered and issued to individuals. So, and even from our perspective, thinking that we did a, couple hundred thousand in the past couple months, it's a conservative goal in some ways. But we want to make sure that our education cluster, our education organizations, our education teams are leaning into this. So those were some of the goals that we'd put out there. In terms of some of the use cases, scenarios that we've talked about, when we were, when Aton introduced the clusters, he talked about atomic networks. That's very clean in the healthcare context. You know, they've got a regional focus, they've got a employer, primary employer, they've got institutions that they want to matriculate into that ecosystem. It's a little bit more atomic. Education has been very broad, and that's much harder to, to distill and organize down to a focus. We've got K-12, we've got higher education, we've got employer, and ongoing continuing education, a variety of formats. We've got education as a sector, where education has workers and it is an employer, et cetera. We also have education that services other industries via its graduates, via its learner workers. So education by nature is a much messier animal to piece together under one umbrella. And so what we did was we started talking about like, how are we gonna think about this? And the two ways we thought about it is, well, there's targeted issuing. So we do have organizations that are institutions or represent institutions, and if they're looking for a place to start, start by 
basically feeding one of our existing clusters, like healthcare. If we've got an institution that maybe trains, has a nursing program or maybe has some relevant nursing or medical degrees or credentials, that that's a place for that organization to start issuing because there's someone on the other end of the phone or it could be quick and easy to get someone on the other end of the phone. So that's the idea of the targeting issuing. And, and we didn't get to other industries yet, although we've heard a couple ideas come up. Then we have this other concept going on where we admitted what we are. We're a messy animal. We're not going to try to pretend we're different. But what we do say is that we have to get something in people's hands, and we have the data in, in a lot of times in education contexts. So let's start getting our data out there into people's hands, and more use cases and atomic networks will creep up and pop up and develop based on the data that we issue. And that's a really important alternate scenario. And so that's why we said, you know, education cluster had two use case scenarios, and we started to see our membership kind of organizing to participate in those two broad scenarios. Now, within there, I've listed out a number of different potential use cases that are starting to shape up, and that's that list on the left. So education, servicing other sectors, nursing licenses, et cetera, state centralized LERs, that those are kind of at least geographic networks that we're starting to have more conversations with and would like to do more to connect those states together using a velocity infrastructure to be really specific. Then there's first job scenarios with respect to the India tech cluster and um, actually students with disabilities has come up in different moments of our member discussions. And so while nothing concrete has been shaped up, there has been some ideas about you know, first job type scenarios and what we can do to support learners edu uh, exiting education. Then education as a sector, a couple things have started to shape up where one is credit for prior learning uh, including military transcripts, and we have member organizations that have um, a role in verifying the, the via assessments what mil exiting service members have achieved, and we actually have member institutions or connections to member institutions that are starting to want to come to the table on that particular topic to see if that credit for higher um, prior learning can more easily be ingested into those institutions of higher education. So that's where some of our existing members are starting to think about. Another one is K-12 teachers and substitute certifications and whether there's an easier way to, to manage that process and even staffing. Um, so a lot of different threads there because there's K-12 teachers and there's substitute teachers and there's staffing moments as opposed to full-time placements and certification moments. So it's also its own kind of messy area, but some ideas and threads going there. Then broad issuing, again, I said before, broad issuing of formal and, in, and informal education. So those are like where our discussions in the education cluster have gone kind of synthesized on one slide for everyone's reference as we talk through. Now, what I hear the most is this chicken and egg problem. Who is first move? The education side of the house says we're working on a lot of things. We have priorities to, you know, get our our seats filled and our do keep our doors open and get enrollment on one hand. So we're really, really busy dealing with kind of, um, you know, very practical, tactical problems. On the other hand, employer, and they say, oh, our employer's ready to receive this information. If we invest in verifiable credentials and digitizing all these records, our employer's ready to receive it. Well, we saw a lot yesterday about employers being ready, and we saw some this morning, but at the same time, the broad mass of education doesn't necessarily see that and believe that yet. But the idea here is that relying parties can't use verifiable credentials unless they're issued. And, and so that's like for us to think about as a message and what our role is to, to solve that problem going forward is that the employer side, people think, oh, well, and our employer's ready to use this, then I'll issue but the employer side can't work with data unless it's been issued. 
And so employer side is starting to do some issuing. At the same time, education has its fingers on data. We're already issuing in a lot of different formats, typically on closed, locked islands. And so our kind of challenge is unlocking those islands and making that data available so that we can grow from there. And at any point, if anyone has a comment or a counterpoint, please raise your hand and jump on in. You can co-sign on something. You can uh, refute something or give your personal opinion. This is really supposed to be more of a conversation. It's unfortunate that we're in the same room facing forward. Okay, so feel free to raise your hands and jump on in. Um, there might be a part that I've misunderstood. Are the educators not the issuers? Because I don't think employers are the issuers, are they? So they could be in some context. If I'm an employer and I do education on the job, I could issue a credential and I'm not excluding that, you know, in terms of education. So, so that's why I reference that edu uh, employer education. Sometimes they bring in extra uh, institutions to actually run a program, but it's the company brand that goes on the end result of that certification. Maybe they have a, an uh, in-house um, like practicum We are talking about the educators, but sometimes employers can be educators. Yeah, yeah, very good, yes. Okay, any other questions or comments on that? All right, so then what this slide does is it takes out the names and the actual organizations, because not every organization is on board with revealing their you know, company strategies, but it shows an early snapshot for anyone who you know, has never seen kind of the layout of Velocity members. This is a snapshot in time from more Q1, but it shows how organizations were progressing through the pipeline of having an idea to actually getting their systems up and running and issuing. We do have, obviously, as you've seen over the weekend, more in the scale-up mode they've launched and they're actually starting to scale up already. So, you know, progress has moved to, the, to my left, your right. But, um, you know, when we talk about oh, are people ready? There's a lot of organizations that are already ready and that does equate to um, at least 5 million or more people placed in jobs already that, you know, our organizations are already on standby working with uh, that kind of scale of, of, of placements in people. So this, for example, is for our reference in here when we think about targeted issuing to the, edu uh, the healthcare cluster. This is an example of how healthcare cluster is starting to scale up their participation. So you see we have a number of issuers of employment and education and license records. You have access to the target population and potential relying parties already in action. Some of these commitments have been solidified and some of those are still shaping up. Mm -hmm. So now we kind of see in the education cluster, and this is not firm commitments, which is why you don't see specific numbers unless they were referenced uh, and solidified on the healthcare slide, but it gives a perspective on the membership that we already have engaged in velocity and at the table. And of course, all these organizations are making their decisions on shaping up their use cases and figuring out what they're gonna do and what they're gonna do first but it does show the potential to really scale within our existing group. And you may see your organization up there, and the question is, what is gonna be your commitment this year and you know, looking forward into 2024? Um, I mentioned in the bottom corner that we're in conversations with a number of organizations that are well known in the space, and you see them there. And you know, their roadmaps are locked for this year. We're not gonna expect anything in 2023. So we're looking to engage them for 2024 and really drive our growth forward with some really big organizations that can uh, you know, build that critical mass and that density that we want. So what's stopping us? And this is a question I want us to all talk through. 
In change management, we talk about a lot of times two kinds of mindsets. You've got the logical mind that is irrational and just makes decisions based on fact. And then there's the emotional mind that sometimes, even though we want to, to, to do that thing, to, to achieve healthy eating, we see a cookie and it tastes really good and we want that. When you do change management, you have to appeal to your logical mind and solve those barriers, and you also have to appeal to your emotional mind and those barriers. So what I'd like to do is go through and just have a conversation and think, what is stopping my organization or an organization that I work with from issuing? And just call it out, and we want to brainstorm what's the answer to solving that problem. And I'm going to take some notes. I thought there would be a whiteboard in here, and there isn't that I see. Um, so what I want us to do is really just think through what is collectively stopping us from either moving the elephant, that logical, I'm sorry, the, the rider, that logical mind forward, or the elephant, our emotional mind, that's a little bit slower, and it's holding us back from moving forward. So when we... Think about each of our barriers. We want to think about, is this a logical barrier? Is there a policy that's holding me back? Is there a, um, is there a technical barrier holding me back? Is there a player not at the table holding me back? Or is it that my people are not educated on what we're trying to achieve and that's holding me back? They're just not, they're not on board, they're not emotionally invested, or my organization is, is really tired right now. Those are all legitimate barriers, but they're of a different kind. And so let's think about what kinds of barriers we have to achieving mass adoption. The um, sponsorship is not a, necessarily at an adequate level in the organization to drive change through the organization. Um, you may have departmental leaders or special projects or people in the provost office, for example, that um, have a degree of influence, but not the same level as the president of the college, for example, or um, you know, the key decision maker. So uh, having very senior sponsorship and commitment um, is extremely important as a success factor. So the inverse is what I'm offering as a potential barrier. Okay. So anybody have any ideas on how we can solve that? And you even saw some of our other members too. So it may not be something we can personally do, but maybe someone else can do something. What do we think we could do to solve that barrier? Um, it's, to extend on that barrier from um, my point of view at the moment is... Um, I would say other leaders in the business understand the concept but can't get past, well, what's my competitive edge on this? And how quickly can I monetize it? And sometimes, well, right now we can't answer that because we don't know what it's going to look like in the UK, mm -hmm. but particularly for what we want to achieve. Um, and, and so that puts it down the list of priorities in an organization, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I almost think we should still keep those separate because they're a little different. Because I think you talked about like monetization and business model. And I don't think, Mark, that that was factored into your your sponsorship. I think you were talking more about like level of sponsorship in, in decentralized organizations, for example, in higher education. There's an underlying monetization impetus, right? Mm -hmm. The fall off in enrollment being desire to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then going back to then Mark's first barrier. So sponsorship not at the appropriate level. What do you think we could do to solve for that? Is that, well, first of all, is that a emotional barrier or is that a logical barrier? Is that a technical one? You think it's technical? Um, I, I think, well, I don't know if it's either, but I still think it's because organisations want to monetise it. I don't think they're separate points, I own it. So if you look at an organisation and their priorities, le um, senior leadership sponsorship will be, will be, you know, the priority will be around monetisation. 
And when, when that's not visible and clear, it will go down the list. Mm -hmm. So we can't, we, we can't hide away from that. And that's, that's the biggest challenge in the room for commercial organisations right now. So we can see, we can, we get it. We get the adoption. We see the future state of play. Edu education providers here are, 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 are on board and delivering, but commercial organisations in my market in the UK are still trying to figure out how it's actually going to make money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's separate issues. So that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I put prioritization as the parent issue, and then I put the two bullet points underneath, not to lose them, but just to think about it differently. Um, you want to jump in? I would, I would suggest at least our own conversations. It, it's if you're jumping to the rational rational discussion first with senior leaders, you, you need a book. This I, I'll tell you internally at Port Ferry, this is testing our storytelling skills a lot because mm -hmm. it's not. The, the full cycle is not really in place yet. So there's, you can show portions of the process, you can't show all of it. Um, so we're having to paint a picture of impact to an individual of what it will be when it is easier for a person to take control of their lives and their career. Um, we're, we're having to paint a picture of the impact the organization can make when we deploy this at scale without all the pieces being in place. Um, Every time we've made it about self-sovereign credentials, we've actually stopped saying that phrase internally. Because our, our senior leadership doesn't know what that means. But they do understand a person taking control of their own professional lives. So I can not get to the rational discussion, but you, you've got to cap in the sea of issues that senior leaders are dealing with, especially right now. You've got to get their head, you've got to get in their heart first. Or at least that's the only way we've been able to make it. So, one of the big barriers in the education marketplace, you know, just seeing it over the years, is exemplified by what happened during COVID. So, during COVID, we did something that had been tried for 15, at least 15 years that I know of, which is one to one technology. So, Students, every student with a device in K-12. So we've been trying to get this one-to-one -one initiative multiple different ways, multiple different funding mechanisms through legislation, and pretty much overnight in, in education terms. March to April, nationwide, one-to-one -one adoption of devices. And, and it's persisting. But we have to kind of think about that took 15 years to provide the infrastructure and the concepts and the adoption mindset uh, to drive forward. So I think about the glacial pace of innovation in education. And that's just, a, that's unfortunately a natural barrier that we have to continue to overcome. So, but I think about like just, I, I, see a lot of their education veterans in the room. So I know that we've all seen this. It's like, okay, never seen anything like that one-to-one -one tech initiative. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, changed, it changed the game. And so I think we really just have to be kind of conscious of the pace of adoption in education and how long it takes to educate and educate the market. Or we have to yeah. find a really good crisis or which it could be a certain class in school, yeah. like a small private, mid sized private, who's facing oblivion. Yeah. Yeah, there could be something about And actually, you know, Mark, going back to your previous kind of challenge with the decentralization of organizations versus the, central organiz the centralization of you know, leadership in terms of steering the way that organizations step forward with transformation. Um, you know, I'm even thinking like w one of our members is a large member organization, particularly working with leaders of educational institutions. Um, so maybe it's about us engaging them a little bit 
um, more tactically to think about how we can educate senior leaders in education. Like for example, Eitan just spoke at the SHRM conference and spoke to a cluster of really senior leaders within the HR space. And maybe that's a similar type of moment that we need to pursue in the education domain so that you know, chancellors and, and provosts are aware of the opportunity and, and then tie it back to what you're saying about like the crisis and how do you frame it in the context of the crisis. Naomi, can I add to what you were saying? So, so I did that presentation with the 10 at our annual conference. Uh, by the way, I'm here, I'm the uh, managing director of Stern Labs. Um, and so what happened after the presentation is we had a couple of people, one of them being a CHRO of um, a major um, organization coming up to us and, and basically saying, this is exactly what I wish I would have had earlier in my career. So going back to what Naomi was saying about the cluster and getting some people, you know, you know, um, to, 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 you know to become aware of what's going on, this is a great way of doing it without, without a doubt. So, yeah. Um, I think another barrier that I should definitely put down is time. And looking at things from the perspective of an employer, I mean, I think the long-term vision is clear, but the opportunity cost or what you're competing against is how long will it take us to realize it. So if you have an initiative that has good value, but it could take three years, five years, but the alternative is something else that takes you one to two, two years, you can see how that part addition shifts depending on what that timeline looks like. But I think the more or the easier we're able to articulate that sort of like timeline, I think the better we're able to convince the decision maker that this is something that we put resources to us in the medium to short term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could just add one point to that. In conversations that I've had with educators about verified credentials, it's the time involved, <coughs> the administrative burden to continuously um, get people their, their credentials, get people their transcripts. Like, there seems to be, so when we talk about the prioritization, is it the ROI of time savings that's um, against the current processes that are in place? I think that that's... I'll ask that question. Oh, um, uh, Rob just stepped out, I guess. Maybe, uh, Mike, you want to kind of give us perspective on that. And um, I know you want to had your hand raised before to jump in. Well, I can only speak for, for higher education, not corporate, but time is not a factor on the academic side. Time is a factor on the administrative side. So you have two opposing forces. Faculty working committees and curriculum works slowly. And registrars and administrators want to work quickly. And that's why it gets mucked up. There's no. Um, incentive to pace on the academic or curricular side is a deliberately slow process if you've ever tried to do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say real quickly was, again, speaking in education, um, I agree with Mark that having the leadership um, is essential, but there are, what our analysis found, there are about six to eight stakeholders in any institution through which credentials walk in the door, ranging from, from um, professional education, to registrar, to a president, to a provost, to an academic dean, to a career center. There's a list of stakeholders. The minority of the time does it come from the leadership. All the time, leadership needs to be involved. And so that idea that it's coming in multiple doors, multiple stakeholders, means that there's a bunch of people who have to be involved. It rarely comes in from the president but the president always has to be involved, and it fails generally when that conversation doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of elaborating on that first challenge that yeah. Mike pointed out. I think to add to that, and also to add to the piece about the storytelling, this is a big enough cluster in like what we're trying to accomplish that any one organization or even person, like those key decision makers' motivations are going to be wildly different. So I may be making it more simplistic than it is, but it, it boils down to the what is in it for them. What are their motivators? Is it the opportunity for innovation and being able to monetize an innovation on top of this utility layer? Is it a motivation like we have at our university where it's a little bit easier for us to make the case for this because we are directly worried about students' return, equity, and their completion of the degrees? 
So it's like figuring out how you make the case where there are different motivations for different organizations and crafting a story around how those are addressed. Um, I think the other piece that's a barrier that I'm kind of working through in my mind is when you have organizations where they may have a steam engine that's like all like full speed ahead and there's a number of them, how do you connect the dots and how do you then sync them up and how do you get what seemingly um, you know, disparate kind of efforts to come together and join when there may be some give and take in those efforts. In the same university, KC? Um, I would say in the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. Well, something, <clears throat> something I want to add, which I think shouldn't get lost in the discussion, is so uh, applying to all of this, everyone's talking about trade offs, right? So it's opportunity cost, how we get people on board, and all this boils down to what are we giving and what are we getting. But I think um, as the people who want more organizations to be on this network, we have to really understand the cost of getting on the network. And by that, what I want to say is, the cost is really not that high. The opportunity cost or the general trade-off when we're approaching it, I think it's very important to kind of really detail the fact that this, if you want to call it migration, onboarding, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the, when, when, we're, when we're dealing with this, um, there's a lot of value to be created, and this can be articulated pretty well. But you know, one of the most important things, I think, with velocity is that the, 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 the trade-off cost of actually applying, utilizing this technology is very low. And uh, apart from the decision-making process, <coughs> should be a relatively easy implementation process once it comes on board. And I think that's actually important uh, within the discussion of getting everyone on board and you know uh, on the right side. I would say that's true in, in a narrow sense, meaning if you get a platform that is able to produce VCs and you know technically and the transaction cost which I think you will refer to upstream of that it can be extremely uh, difficult to refactor your curriculum to align with the industry needs and to ensure that the content of these credentials is rigorous and of high quality. Um, because over the first years, institutions have deep work, really, uh, I have to say, many institutions, not WGU. Um, their their uh, curriculum degrades over time and starts to lose a connection. And so there's a lot of a tremendous amount of work associated with upgrading curriculum to align with the skills based needs of, of industry. So that's part of this kind of a strategic effort. It's really a massive change management undertaking in some schools. So when we're talking about, you know, um, getting people on board, are we talking about aligning all the education so that they're matching with the industry requirements on a skill level? Uh, is this how we're approaching this? I mean, or that, that would certainly be an important <coughs> benefit, of course. Of course, but I think this is this is kind of like a the, the, the second step when, when, when approaching velocity, because as the first part, we already have curriculums and education courses that we're giving and uh, credentials. I think just first getting those on the network and then saying, okay, now we can do this group answer and let's look at our curriculums and let's see what we need to change. I mean, I, I think that's kind of, uh, I, I think it should be kind of a later thought in the process. Logical. So if I can translate that or just kind of synthesize that, it's that one of the responses or maybe one of the solutions for that problem is, well, just start with what you have and then do the better, you know, um, articulation and um, the, the better sequencing and pathways work as we keep moving this whole thing forward. But just start with what you have and everything else will, will improve after you've started. 
entry point for everybody. And what that entry point is, if you want to take the first step to exactly where you are, and you're going to get to tech to work for your entry point is we're going to take one credential and we're going to do this and get it into the network. That's another entry entry point. I think the biggest barrier, in my opinion, and it's the hardest one to solve for, is the tech. The tech is easy. It's changing the hearts and minds of people. <laughs> That's the challenge. Like when we've been doing, you know, something in this way for so long, especially in higher ed, there has to be a real case to change those hearts and minds to get movement from tradition and what is easy because we've done it so long. So we work in we work in the state level um, education space, and so Marty used the term of glacial pace. I, I think that's, I think they move more like, that's like the same bulk compared to most education agencies that we deal with. And the reality that that I see in my, you know, I've got blinders, but we're very specific about, about where, we, where we work, is that most things don't make it, education, and this is a, a, an Apple representative that we deal with, I won't, I won't give his name, but he says, if you take educate or if you take current business technology and you back up 10 years, that's where education technology is. And it's not that you don't have the minds that are capable of understanding the tech. It's the fact that they they have to prepare and plan for the least common denominator. You're not always going to be out in the front leading. So you said and you nailed it, it's going to take time. And usually it has to be. Business has to adopt it out here, and eventually it will be pulled into into the education area. That's how that's how we've observed it. But I love that idea of I love the idea of that, that you said. Right, you've got the, the people that come in, the elected types, want to come in and boom, do something big and do something quick, but then they're gone, and then that that's no longer funded, and so it doesn't happen. So the glacial pace, I would say it's a lot like an archaeological dig if you go into a state unit or a state uh, education agency. If you look at the tech, I mean, you can see everything from some people have new tech at their desks, and then there's an abacus, and then there's some kinetic on top of it. It's like that. So, so one thing that we're, we haven't mentioned yet is, is legislation. Right. I mean, the legislative aspect of this moves a lot of things forward. I'll give North Dakota as an example. The reason why North Dakota deployed a wallet that has a blockchain backend is because there was a piece of legislation in North Dakota that says we need to pilot a blockchain solution of some kind. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, paying attention to the, the legislative um, agendas and the you know, National Governor Association doing a tremendous amount of work with governor's offices and, and and trying to educate them. You know, that's Alabama, for example, of the governor's office, just highly engaged uh, in in this you know next generation of hiring and employment. Uh, but I don't discount paying attention to legislative agendas. Uh, around the country, in the US at least, um, to say where are they in these areas? Are there any pieces of legislation being proposed? I know Alex, which Alex Kaplan, uh, does a lot of work uh, in this space, understanding where where the legislative uh, mindsets are. Um, because that will, you know, that can, that can be a piece indicator and also opportunity for that mindset to flip up in a meaningful way. To that point is that there could be friendlier states that we want to kind of target initially. Yes. So Naomi, I share an idea. Yeah, absolutely. So bear with me, everybody and those who date back a little bit on my age. Um, retail supply chain, 80s. We had a very fragmented ecosystem. 
manufacturers, textile, distributors, logistics, retail stores. And there was a ton of room for improvement financially in that supply chain, which moved merchandise. And the NHRA, NHRA uh, National Retail, I'm sorry, NRNA, National Retail Merchants Association, came back and said, okay, there's this new thing we're gonna, we're gonna explore called the barcode. And we wanna put this barcode on every piece of merchandise so we can automate the flow of merchandise. And there's this company called Symbol that came up with this scanner that can read that barcode so we could scan that. So what you had was a revolution of technology taking on a supply chain issue of moving merchandise through markets. And I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing a supply chain for you and like, like And I think uh, the notion of verified credentials is awesome. But I think it's a North Star. I think there's a process that this whole piece needs to kind of go through. And the idea of the notion of a supply chain infograph that kind of maps out a roadmap of how we could start where we can and where we could end up. Uh, case in point, what's in it for me? Employers, they want to move from degree verification to a person's ability to do the job. Doesn't necessarily mean where they live, what school they went to, what degree they have, but what skills do they have and how well they can do it. Um, I think if we need the schools to start mapping competencies to those programs, to those, you know, so that we can at least start to extract how do we relate what a student's learning to what an employer needs. And then along that way, we're collecting, you know, to me, credentials are what's wrong with a, a non verified credential so we've used and continue to use today, it's a resume. So, or a LinkedIn. Um, if we took a and just bear with me 60 more seconds. If we took a survey, how many employers are hiring people based on credentials versus a resume and a background check? 99% are hiring based on resumes and background checks and references. So to try to move to a credential, a verified credential hiring metaphor or a reskilling metaphor internally, and I, I, don't, I don't see that happening in one time. But what I do see happening is the process to get there. So if we can roadmap that and we can include both non-verifiable or self-tested data plus verifiable data so that schools can understand how they can actually participate in that and then employers can understand how they can actually start using it, I think that starts bringing these two worlds together. Just a humble thing. And then it's down to a roadmap. <laughs> yeah. Of how this point chain could actually work. I, I, I wanted to say something about actually this. I had a similar idea regarding a roadmap because you know we were talking about kind of these more emotional barriers on um, doing stuff differently in yeah. essence. And I think it's really important to be able to, and also with the storytelling point, uh, being able to kind of really, really map what it's going to look like at the end of the day. And if for people that are trying to um, persuade other um, leaders in our, our, our around this to get on this, really place that end map, like end, end state in a situation where they could say, okay, this is not a lot of change. This is maybe even um, a non-seeable change. Maybe it's just in the background when we're already issuing credentials, we have the credentials on the Velocity Network, but as a result, the organization would have moved into the network. I think kind of being able to play that in a way which we could be more persuasive and say, okay, this is not that big of a change because, you know, we can, we can hide it under here or maybe it's just in the background. I think that both map and the correct point of an end plot is very important when approaching with something like this. Because I do understand the emotional barrier, and I do understand that change is difficult when dealing with things like this, but I think velocity has a, a you know, has, has a more advantageous point because it's, it, it doesn't have to be the biggest kind of, um, you know, 
branding change, post change, or uh, general product change in the world? So as I was just tracking kind of comments, I put this under our conversation of the what's in it for me and, you know, changing people's minds and so forth. But um, going back to that whole point about sponsorship versus some of the other decentralized players is there, I feel like what we're falling under is like education right across the board. Like people have different motivations and yes, you have to play to all those motivations, but there's also the, 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 the broader issue of educating people on that future end state and the value of it, right? But then are we saying that there's different, I think we are saying that there's different education that has to happen at the most senior levels of our institution so that they can correctly prioritize what their next steps are. Is that something that sounds correct coming out of this conversation? And would that also then solve the glacial place of change or is that glacial place of change still hanging out there? Is that just a, is, is glacial place of change in education, is that a fact that we just have to like leave out there and work around and keep going? Or is there something we should be tactically doing to solve that glacial pace of change? I think if, um, you're thinking about the Alex, if we could show and demonstrate what success looks like and others can see themselves in that value and kind of jump in. I was just thinking about all the Wellspring Initiative partners that have done a lot of this heavy lifting to get where we want to go, all of the work that we do, you, and all the credentials that you have. You know, think about education design lab and the 50 community colleges they're working with to deconstruct, you know, stackable credentials that can lead to credit. And it takes a lot of work. They're they're doing all of this hard work and it's the I don't know, like I just I think that the like an interesting next step would be to take all of the assets that have already been in progress for the last two and three years and find means by which we can put them into action on here and show the connection to employers who are willing to hire for those credentials. You could almost generate from that, you know, back to the point of where there's a will, there's a way, and there's an entry point no matter what the starting place is. So if there was some kind of a you think of like a playbook, like how to velocity, right? Like if this is where you are, here's a step that you could take. If your appetite is this much to get started, like this is one step that requires very little like resource time energy, all the way to you're all bought in, here's how to velocity. So then that way you can have those conversations even at the senior leader level where I don't think anybody is gonna say like, you know, doing this for the benefit of, you know, our economy and for humans is a bad thing. I think we're just in there. Yeah. But it's like, we would love to partake. How do we do it and where can we start? And so if the registrars were to simply produce PDFs and would get them onto the network, they would get paid for that, right? Would the school get paid yes. um, as a, a credit, get the credits? Yeah. Yes. So that's a pre, and to your suggestion, that, that's a um, very simple next first step to at least dip your toe into it. Now, it wouldn't be a structured data, it wouldn't be, you know, from our point of view, a, a badge or a CLR based achievement, but, but it would be on the, on the chain. And so that could begin the process of, of a yeah, I, and and actually, digital credential. I'm sorry. Uh, the the way the the monetization rails work within Velocity, I think that's a layer two credential, not a layer one credential. So it might affect. That's yeah. It's a decision to say that what if a layer one? What if one of the, the basic credentials of us network would be a PDF transfer? We can do that. I'm not sure. Again, probably what, what Mark is suggesting, you know, if that would be the fastest path to start getting thousands of education institutions across the barrier starting, you know, that's a discussion that in our standards committee, what does that mean for systems to do? consume this? Is it valuable for the other players in the network? But Mark, I'm following up on what you're saying, you know, if that's, if that's easier for universities to understand, for education, those are things exactly that we can Propose bring to the right forms here in the grid. I'm taking a note just on the, the idea that we can explore further on the idea of a PDF transcript being an easier starting point. And maybe, 
Alex, maybe you'd like to weigh in on that or even Rob, because you guys know where institutions are and maybe what would be an easier output for institutions. And also, uh, Mike, maybe you have thoughts on that. That the over 80% of the transcripts that travel today are PDFs. Um, that is after 30 years of trying to get schools to send data instead of PDFs. So uh, they have a very, very hard time adapting to potentially sending data. Um, and especially for something like a transcript. Um, there, there, there are other concerns there with regards to uh, still uh, the transcript being a little bit fluid even after you finish your, your education. Um, educators still, um, the, the administrative side of the business still tends to make minor adjustments to that. So the, therefore, they, there's a level of control that they want to have over it. Um, but, and, 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 Hence the reason that they set up PDFs and the technology, the SIS is also a massive trouble to produce that. Um, we, uh, we, have, we have the second largest partner with the solution and we've thrown all our weight behind them going to send us data and they, they still cannot extract data in a way for a transcript and send that to us. So, we can distribute them to other students. And for me to mention PDF is like heresy, right? That's heresy. <laughs> but what if, what if there was a, an incentive after the PDF? You see, my concern about doing the PDF is that it would die right there. That would be it. And it wouldn't go any further. There wouldn't be a next step. Because <coughs> people would have at least some benefit from having a PDF on the chain. But w what if they didn't receive the full credit? What if it was a tiered system that would progress them towards um, the, the desired form? Interesting. They got a half credit for PDF, you know, but they get a full credit if it's a, a badge or a structure. Yeah. Well, that is one, one of the things that is a benefit of kind of the Boston approach is that you pair these layer one, layer to credentials together. So you can have a layer one, which is very simple. Hey, this is a, this is a PDF transcript, basically, for this person. And then the layer two is the PDF itself. So, so actually, that's kind of already supported from a, from a technical perspective. You just have to kind of <coughs> take a step back and think about how, how little can you say about the PDF in that layer one to make it simpler on the institution to say you don't have to, you don't have to give that much information uh, from, a, from a date. And you can still have, I, mean, I think about the same values, that they're integrating into that meeting, right? I mean, they have their, their logo stamped on it, there's a brand value that's associated with that transcript integration that they want to maintain, which, you know, Velocity could do that in the sense that the issuer is highly visible in most cases. The logo of the issuer is highly visible. Um, but I think about how little, how little can you change the process, still adding value and reducing friction. And then, allow, and that allows for the innovation to occur almost by default. I think it would be ideal if there would be a credential engine identifier for every single transcript issue, because that would hold the skill. Um, but it would have a different role than the transcript itself. It, it, we'll, 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 once you start looking into the transcript, it has, it has for instance, on the back of every transcript, it has a grading scale. Across the nation, there are at least three, four, five, six different grading scales. So that means that you also have a different way of approaching what you do with that transcript once it becomes a digital convention. Um, I, I, I don't see an easy, simple solution to that in, in reality. But, well, Casey, do you, do you want to say something about that? Or? Um, I, I don't know what I would add. Yeah, I, 
I agree, you're right. Can, can I ask somebody the education? So there's no background standards here. And, and the transcript is the, still the primary source of information in the education world, but it isn't in the employment world. Employers want to verify the person actually received the degree, what that, what, what the institution was, what their major was, maybe what their GPA is, and they, they actually have received that. That is, and today they're paying a lot of money to verify that information. It takes them a long time, often, sometimes, definitely when it's global. You know, maybe the U.S. NSC solves a lot of that, but around the world, it's a very big, complicated problem. They just want that. Right? And, and so, is there a lower barrier where there are certain institutions to issue the degree? It's not a transfer. Transfer can be a layer two, it can be a PDF attached to that. But just say, just the testing to that simple factor. Just what employers are looking for today, what they're paying a lot of money for, is just to say, Eitan Bernstein graduated from industrial engineering from Ben University in 1997 with this great plan. That, that, that exists. They have it, it's in the transcript as well. But that's what important, that's today, not, before we talk about a skill-based economy and micro-credentials and all that stuff, which is the next thing over, that's the basic thing people are really frustrated with today. But well, that is for, a micro-credential in my point of view. For US education, that's three seconds, our SLA is on three seconds, so I, I think that that's hard to, to, to compete with in, in some ways. But I think for a background screener, you have more more things that you need to get to, you know, criminal background and all that kind of stuff, prior employment. But yeah, it's hard to compete with, let's say, a three-second SLA on just you're, that. You're right, day. you're right. The problem is three-second SLA with you, and nor is it the one from NCSBN. It's five-second SLA with NCSBN, mm -hmm. and it's 20 seconds with you. Right. You need to go to all these different sources to verify all this information. You're paying $120 to the background screener to do that outreach, while if eventually our vision is that everything is in one place, and we don't need to go to all these different places. Even with the value, the enormous value that the systems have set up, it's still this first world where you need to access all those, you need to pay for some of them, some of them are free. And that's the world, that, that's the first world we have today, where it's the self-sovereign centralized, centralized by the individual, not on Equifax. Uh, centralized by the individual that they control. That, that's the difference that we're aiming, we're trying to achieve. And I, I think the challenge in, for this forum is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking over your session. I keep doing that to know me, but the challenge is to this forum, how do we get that minimum to go? And I'm, I'm working on what Mark was saying. Is it a transcript? Is it a simple credential, of, we call it a badge, or uh, of, of just the completion of my, uh, of my education? You know, there's a related issue that we've been struggling with, and um, Mr. Schwartz brought it up in his session, where he was talking about the demise of the big skills matching yeah. engine, right? And we came to that conclusion uh, that um, trying to match skills by by semantically is is we're not there. So. The placeholder that is currently available to all of us is this concept of degree, of certificates, which is a type of degree, but also certifications, right? Commercial certifications, which are accredited organizations. They're of high quality, they're rigorous. So that there's a lot good with this concept of certification. So if we were to simply say, we'll have success when, I think that the, that's a, the degree, is the credential, it may be including, well, that would include the AA, right? And a certification is a credential. Very simple, it's not a lot of data, not hard to create, but that would be a huge first step. And it would bypass the impossible job of doing skills matching because of the idea that you know what someone who has a PMI certificate is capable of doing, plus or minus some adjacent skills, right? So um, it's heading in the direction, that, uh, that, that's a very positive direction from our point of view. I think one really important thing that should be also in the discussion is, while we're talking about entry points, there's also the players of the credential Asian operators, like us, and we have also other Asian operators here, and it's actually our job for 
the organizations to be able to issue credentials to these networks. And you know, as agent operators, I think it's crucial for these organizations to be matched with the correct agent operators for them to be able to issue their data into the network as easily as they could. And this makes the process perhaps exponentially easier when we're talking about it from such perspective that the important thing is these institutions have the data and we're all trying to get this data to the network. That's why we're all talking about this. For this data to get to the network, we already have the middle people, which are the credential agent operators, which we which would be able to do anything that they need to to get the data to the network as easily as possible. For instance, even if we're talking about degrees, um, let me just talk personally for certified here, we would have the technology to even scan degrees and extract the skills that are related to these degrees and skills and GPAs and do these in an automated fashion. So what I'm trying to say is as long as we can get a yes to get the data on the network, how we can get it and what we can get, that part could be handled by other parties who are actually really good at doing this stuff and really quick at getting things done. And I think that's important to you know, put into the discussion while we're talking about this because they don't have to do it themselves. So I think you just made, I mean, a case like that, that's a playbook, right? Like you just explained yeah. like what an entry point could be, but how many organizations like know that's the case? I know right now we're like really trying to pitch that to the president of our university or any other. They're going to want to know who is it that can do it for us, what's it going to cost? Again, what's in it for me and what kind of lift is it? Uh -huh. But having you know discrete use cases where we can say we can do this for this cost, this amount of money, like that, that's a piece that's the piece that's missing. It's a, a knowledge component about what's yeah. possible. Yeah. And you'll get paid. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I think this is where the velocity team comes in too, because they know everyone, they know who does what, and they know the parties inside. So I think if we were to be able to get people to talk with them, they would be able to like really fasten that process, get everyone talking with the important people, and then really expedite the process. But and know. I actually think actually one of our members that's not here at the table is working on a similar type playbook that's education design labs. Um, you know, specifically to figure out what solutions are out there that they can present to institutions and so forth. So maybe it's a little bit more of a partnership with them to even more clearly articulate the pathway of some of the pieces that maybe are left out as you're doing like a big survey of wallets, right? You, you miss out some of the other pieces of technology that have to be there to manage the end-to-end -end process of getting the institution to issue. So, so if, you um, look, if you look at the roadmap of that, that playbook yep. addresses, and you think about the two biggest headlines today, or at least two that I've heard, yeah. from the educators, senior leadership. Enrollment's off, somebody mentioned it before, pretty staggering numbers. Why is it off? Because the students don't, they're questioning whether education in general and the cost of that education is worth it to get a job. And on the flip side, you see a lot of companies moving toward no degree hiring, okay, or at least they're not, they're not looking at a degree for a specific hire, they want to know if they can do the job. When you have a roadmap that maps those two, then you have the big picture that leadership can get to say, ah, this is how I can be part of this and hook into it. And then the road, and then the playbook, this is how I do it. And this is what's in it for me. It's just you know, an idea of a bigger picture kind of get that to buy you. So your senior leadership are thinking strategically, right? It's not a tactical day to day. It's, um, all right. So I want to honor people's lunch. I think we're over because we started late. So please, if you um, need to take a break, go grab lunch.